there's many so-called diseases in Western medicine that are symptom-based diagnoses. Fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, you know, that's two of them. So once it has a diagnosis, it's like, this is what it is. You don't have to look any further. We have a diagnosis for it. This is what it is. Well, how did I get fibromyalgia? What do you mean, how did you get it? This is what you have. This is it. I just told you what you have. Now you can sleep at night. You know what you have. Like it, you know, you don't have to worry about it anymore. Like, what, it's, I mean, it's a, it's a crazy mentality. Somebody comes in, what is the cause of their illness? You know, fibromyalgia, it's a completely, it's a ridiculous symptom-based diagnosis. Somebody has, they have pain. They have, uh, you know, pain in these multiple spots on the body. They have fatigue. They have random flare-ups. They, you know, can present with depression. You know, a common, common treatment is... Uh, SSRIs, you know, let's, and that's the, that's the idea with a number of conditions that are symptom-based. We don't know what to do. We think that uh, neurotransmitters, boosting the inhibitory neurotransmitters is going to help reduce your pain and help you feel better. The idea that we don't know what's causing it. We're going to give somebody antidepressants to make them think that they feel better and have less of an emotional tie to their illness. So we're going to get them less depressed because we're boosting their uh, inhibitory neurotransmitters to help with depression and anxiety. And whether or not it helps with their pain, you know, it doesn't matter because they're going to think they feel better. Something like chronic fatigue from myalgia, I mean, it's, it's generally referred out to a specialist. And then the, the specialists, they were taught in school that fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, it's a set of symptoms without, without any laboratory analysis being able to show you that something is causing this. It's very common with fibromyalgia chronic fatigue, somebody has a flare-up. Why are they all of a sudden having a flare-up? You can do a blood test, and you can test, especially for the Epstein-Barr virus, to see is the virus active or not. So if somebody gets the Epstein-Barr virus, they can have this acute uh, short-term presentation, you know, which manifests as mono. And some people, they'll be exposed, and they won't have any presentation like that, but what they will end up developing is a chronic uh, long-term uh, uh, long-term illness that is commonly going to be diagnosed as fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue. There's the Epstein-Barr virus that can cause mono, and then there's the cytome cytomegalovirus that can cause mono. So both these can have that acute presentation and in that acute presentation, what I've seen in my office, especially acute Epstein-Barr, is uh, it can potentially be life-threatening, uh, that acute presentation. I've seen people with uh, Epstein-Barr-induced hepatitis, where the liver function is severely compromised, liver enzymes, you know, up, you know, close to a thousand, I mean, very severe. Um, you know, and then they're treated acutely, uh, you know, in terms of uh, supporting liver function, um, you know, you can use natural or prescription antivirals to treat it. The thought nowadays is that it's Epstein-Barr virus, cytomegalovirus, um, herpes 6 virus, and then uh, parvovirus uh, B19. So. These viruses, 
they're known to have major complications on the immune system, usually short term. Some people, it can be life threatening. The idea is they're in your body and they're there. And, you know, just like chicken pox and uh, shingles, chicken pox is a herpes virus, you know, it'll come and go. Many people have multiple infections. Somebody can have the Epstein-Barr virus, somebody can have the cytomegalovirus, somebody can have the herpes 6. Uh, they could have all of them. And then a number of the antivirals, they may be effective against one of the viruses, but not another. So most people are familiar with, you know, most doctors are familiar with testing the Epstein-Barr virus through IgG and IgM and the uh, the nuclear tests. So while those three are certainly good tests uh, and the IgM can show active, you should always be retesting the early antigen. So with that you can see is it reactivated or not. Sometimes uh, I have seen it before where the early antigen is still low but the IgM is high and I've seen it where the early antigen is high and the IgM is low. You have to do, you have to be able to test and be able to interpret. The provider should have a vested interest in seeing what, what is the cause of their illness and what can we do to help them get better. So they go to their provider, they say, I want a Epstein-Barr virus IgG early antigen test. I also want an Epstein-Barr virus IgM test. I also want a cytomegalovirus IgG test and a cytomegalovirus IgM test. I want a herpes 6 virus HHV6 IgG test, HHV6 IgM test, parvovirus B19 IgG test, parvo parvovirus B19 IgM test. Go get those tests done. There's not great testing for the cytomegalovirus or the herpes 6. I mean, there's, there's no early antigen testing. There's an IgM test, which is when something's in the acute phase, but there's antibody, there's antibody switching that happens. So somebody will be in the acute phase for about 12 weeks with a high IgM, and then it switches to an IgG. So let's say you tested somebody in their 13th week and you don't see the IgM positive anymore and the IgG is off the chart. You know, let's say uh, the high end of, um, I think the high end of the cytomegalovirus, you know, it might be, might be three, you know, in terms of the scale uh, to positive. You know, and somebody, a lot of times this, the lab the reporting of antibody values per microliter is only going to go up to 10. So it'll just give you a, a value greater than 10. So they're off the chart. You don't know if they're 11, you don't know if they're 10.1, you don't know if they're 100, but they're greater than 10. So like, I mean, you have to look at that and think, okay, did they potentially have a recent exposure? Did they have potentially a recent uh, you know, reactivity, reactivation of the virus, you know, or do they just have great immunity where they get one uh, measles vaccine when they were a child and their value is going to be off the chart, you know, when they're, you know, 40, 50 years old as well. You know, and you can test these people and you can see, like, you can get a perspective on how is their immune system functioning? Because you could, let's say they had the measles, so you could retest the antibody, do a quantitative test, and see where are their antibody values relating to that, and when did they get the measles vaccine. And it can give you some perspective, potentially. Whoever the provider is, they'll see the results, and if they don't know how to interpret the results, they should read up on it, and ask them to read up on it and like don't settle for a diagnosis with no cause. But generally in my practice, I'll 
try herbal initially and you know, retest see, and go by symptoms as well as lab values you know, after, usually after uh, two months at the earliest. And then depending on how somebody's doing, potentially go to prescription antivirals. So prescription antivirals, every once in a while, the valacyclovir will, will work. Uh, generally, generally it's the Volgan cyclovir that's truly effective against cyto cytomegalovirus and Epstein-Barr. The, the Valgan cyclovir, so uh, it can have more side effects in terms of depressing the white blood cell production um, you know, and, and fatigue along with that and you have to monitor liver enzymes. So one, you have to do the right testing in terms of following up to make sure their body is tolerating it properly. Uh, and also it's short term. You can support liver function, but you want, I mean, you want to knock these viruses down, hopefully, God willing, to the point where the immune system may be able to deal with it. So one of the things I'll do is a, a food test to see what, what foods somebody's immune system is reacting to. And then from there, we take them out, not forever, you know, three to six months, depending on what antibody, what the antibody reaction is, and allow the immune system to, to regroup and focus where it needs to. I just had somebody come to me uh, last week. Somebody from New York, they didn't know why they were, uh, why they were feeling so terrible you know, they had this chronic sore, sore throat for three months. Their energy had been going down for a number of months. They had been to their primary. They had been to an internist. They had multiple tests. Nobody could tell them what was going on. They had Epstein-Barr testing. Their liver enzymes were elevated. They couldn't tell them what was going on. I looked at the test, and, I mean, it's very clear <laughs> based on the test and looking at being familiar with the the levels of uh, antibody, the IgM was positive and the early antigen was positive. Like it wasn't. If somebody took the time to look into it just a little bit deeper, they would have seen. Oh, this is clearly an active Epstein Barr virus infection that's causing acute hepatitis. Like, but the thing is, there's the way it's reported from. The lab that this New York physician was using, so it comes, it's printed out by the lab, the, the criteria for an active or past infection. And based on, you know, the way the computer is set to score it, that's how they interpret it. They didn't, they didn't even think about it. So, I mean, it was just, it was very surprising to me. Hospitals are generally nonprofit, and hospitals many times give away medical care, which is absolutely beautiful. Okay, a lot of times it doesn't have to be surgery. <laughs> it could be some, you know, consultation and nutritional counseling, uh, you know, every single week or twice a week to help somebody get healthy instead of, uh, you know, a one-time, you know, six-hour operating room visit for $100,000 or $200,000. Like, okay, let's take that money and let's be more health-oriented as opposed to disease-oriented. Shalem Healing, it's a nonprofit, integrative, uh, holistic medical clinic. So why is it nonprofit? Because there's there's so many people out there that can't afford proper treatment. Healthcare costs money. There's no question. But not having your health, like, I mean, it's, you can't put a price on somebody not having their health.